Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogue. I am your host, Shante Charles. I hope that you all are having a great and wonderful day. As you can see, our conversation box is open to everyone this morning. Um, so we want to give an opportunity um, for those of you who maybe have been watching for a while and you have a question or a or a comment, you can give it on our open broadcast. I do have a couple of things I want to read today. Um, so if we don't have any questions, then I will definitely go into those readings. All right. So good morning to Pastor Ben. Good morning, Lady Barbara. I'm not sure who else is down there. It is a happy, happy, happy Friday. <laughs> I had a very, very, very interesting day yesterday, um, right after I got off the broadcast and um, had to do, had to take care of an acquisition for my home. So um, I'm excited about what we were able to accomplish, but it did take a great bit of time. <laughs> So I was pretty pooped by the time I got back home. Happy Friday to be loved. So those of you who are with us for the first time, this is Daring Dialogues, and I am Shante Charles, your host. Um, the information on the back is where you can find me, and you can find all of my goodies online. <clears throat> um, I do have some ground rules for those of you who may be with us for the first time. So I have taken the time to actually write them down, okay? Ground rules, no profanity. I don't respond to profanity. Um, I don't respond to name calling and no soliciting. Um, we're not gonna show you anything here, but wisdom, hopefully, and something that can increase you, something that can be of help to you. Um, today, specifically, we're talking business and health and um, we're going to go from there. So if you are with us for the first time, just keep these things in mind. Um, this is not the space to solicit, um, and this is also not the space to solicit your products. If you have a product that you would like to, me to consider to either share on the show or to test your product and give a review, you can reach me at reachshante at gmail.com. Again, that's reachshante at gmail.com, and I will give you information on how to do that. Good morning, King Charles, and good morning, Prophet Jonathan. Good morning, Bespoke, and good morning to those of you all who are watching by Facebook. Good morning to those of you who are watching outside of the Periscope app, either on Twitter or by your laptop. So I think that covered everybody. All right, so I did have... <clears throat> I did have two questions that came in um, between yesterday and this morning, and I wanted to talk about them first before I got into our business and our health segment. Both of those questions were tied to the church. Um, and both of those questions, well, one came from an older young lady, and the other one came from a millennial. The older person was talking about an incident that um, that happened in their church where um, a leader was inappropriate with them and they have tried to um, get the attention of the other leaders. And so the question was, what should they do? All right, what should they do? If a leader has been inappropriate um, and you have tried to get the attention of their superiors, and their superiors are ignoring what happened. What should they do? All right. She didn't go into a whole lot of detail. Um, but my thing is, number one, if it's physically abusive or sexual, you need to involve actual authorities in whatever happened. Okay. So that there is some sort of record to go with um, you having addressed this. And that way the authorities can do a proper investigation and... Um, make sure that things are addressed, okay? So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is if it had to do more along, you know, a spiritual line, okay, then if you're not getting a response from that leadership, then the next step would be to 
get some witnesses if you have any witnesses okay and address that person and the leadership all together if they're unwilling to do that um, then I would suggest that you definitely make sure that you're finding another place to worship because you don't want to be in a situation where everyone that you are you know connected to feels as if you're quote unquote ganging up on that leader and that's not a spiritually healthy place for you to be in I also want to say this when it comes to um, dealing with misconduct in churches all right there's a difference between a church having an issue with misconduct and one particular leader having an issue with misconduct and oftentimes the entire church gets blamed um, because the entire church gets blamed because um, that's what we tend to do right but you have to make sure that you've gone through the proper protocol and make sure it's not just that person okay there's been plenty of scandals out there where you know maybe the leader had an issue and the church actually handled it correctly either their board was there that brought some accountability to that leader and had that leader to step down or had that leader to go through counseling for where, whatever it was and so that's where you can kind of differentiate between is this a corrupt leader or is this a leader that is um, dealing with their own personal struggles or is this church corruption all right church corruption is where the leader is corrupt <laughs> the board is corrupt the church body is corrupt like you know no one is willing to address um, issues of any kind whether it be sexual sin or otherwise and pre people are pretty much going along with it or they're not saying anything or they don't want you to say anything about it that's more than just one individual having a problem in a church that is a that is a church corruption issue and um, I don't encourage people to stay in a situation where if something goes down that's ungodly no one in the church is going to rally around the idea of righteousness truth justice and holiness and if everybody is okay with that kind of behavior and kind of brushing it off or shrugging it off then that is not a healthy church environment all right so I just wanted to say that the other question I got was um, they were the person was saying that they were having a hard time um, going to any church at all and what would I recommend all right and so one of the things that I recommend is that you find a ministry um, that is following what what we call an ecclesia model okay what does that mean it means that they're actually following the teachings of Christ <laughs> all right that is not just a a, a a place that you go to where everything is um, about tradition or where everything it has what what I would call an ecumenical focus to it okay and you can go to certain churches and you know that they're a part of maybe a larger larger organization because they're very cookie cutter they're very formatted everybody does the same thing at the same time um, and there's nothing wrong with that per se um, it can become a problem when you say it's our way or the highway or when you begin to tie your man-made structure to being equal with the Word of God all right let me give you an example so if I you know attended a ministry or I attended a church where um, maybe we had communion on on first Sundays and everybody was supposed to wear white and for whatever reason I didn't you know I wore black to the first Sunday communion um, if I get called in for that and I get made to feel like you know basically I'm going to hell because I didn't have on the right color to perform um, communion that is problematic okay so that's what I mean by um, making sure that you are going somewhere or you're in fellowship with somewhere that is not taking their traditions and making them equal to the Word of God all right so 
if you are looking for a, a, a place of worship, an assembly, an ecclesia, in other words, it's the called out body of Christ, um, those are some things that I would in encourage you to kind of pay attention to. How do they take the word of God? Do they take the word of God seriously or are they elevating their traditions above the word of God? That's kind of one um, key thing that you want to look for in any assembly that you go to. All right. So those were my two questions to start uh, the morning. And I want to get into back into this book here. Anything you want by Derek Seavers. Anything you want by Derek Seavers. It's 40 lessons for a new kind of entrepreneur. And Derek Seavers is the the original founder of CD Baby. And these are um, 40 short lessons that he learned in creating and building that company. And um, so one of the things he talks about here in terms of business is he asked the question, how do you grade yourself? How do you grade yourself? He says, in New York City, there are dozens of buildings that say Trump on them. As I was driving about an hour into the rural countryside, I even saw a Donald J. Trump park, which actually, um, they're actually trying to get that park renamed um, to the young lady that was killed in Charlottesville. They're actually trying to get that park renamed to Heather Heyer Park, by the way. It made me wonder if he grades himself according to how many valuable properties bear his name. Plenty of real estate tycoons have made billions without putting their names on everything, but maybe that's his measure. We all grade ourselves by different measures. For some people, it's as simple as how much money they make. When their net worth is up, they believe they're doing well. For others, it's how much money they can give. For some, it's how many people's lives they can influence for the better. For others, it's how deeply they can influence just a few people's lives. For me, it's how many useful things I create, whether songs, companies, articles, websites, or anything else. If I create something that's not useful to others, then for me, it doesn't count. But I'm also not interested in doing something useful unless it needs my creative input. So how do you grade yourself? It's important to know in advance to make sure that you're staying focused on what's honestly important to you instead of doing what others think you should. All right. And so he gives you a couple of different measures by which you can grade yourself. Right. And most of us are probably grading ourselves by more than one thing. Right. I know for me, it's important for me to continue to give back to people. It's important for me to continue to give back to those who are less fortunate, all right? Another one that's important for me, like he said, it's important for me to create things that are useful that will be here long after I am gone, such as music and writing. Those are important to me. Um, when I get questions about relationships, when I get questions about love, I often point people to my work because if you want to know what I think about love, relationships, courtships, and you actually want solutions in an entertaining package, then I'm always going to refer you to my book series, Church Love. It's entertaining, but it's also educational. And I've seen plenty of love stories happen after the couple reads the books. So, I know that what's written works and I know that the principles in those books actually work because they're biblical principles. So I'm going to always say, hey, after you after you get done searching through the word of God on what relationships are like and after you get through searching the word of God on what God says marriage is, check out these books over here because I've taken some of those principles and I've wrapped them up in an entertaining story and I think that you will appreciate it. So again, one of the keys of business is how do you grade yourself? And as he said, it is important to know in advance what kind of measures you're using for yourself so you don't get caught up in what somebody else thinks your measures should be. All right. 
So if your measures are only money and your measures are the bottom line, then you have to think about what would happen if the business sectors and the business areas that I'm in, what it would happen if those business sectors go away? Would I still be doing what I'm doing now? Would I still enjoy it? Or am I only in it for the money? All right. Um, a friend of mine and very well-known uh, businesswoman out of Africa, uh, but she is based here in the United States. Uh, her name is Jokotade, J-O-K-O-T-A-D-E, Jokotade.com. She has a very, very good um, class out now because as she lives in the Houston area, one of the things that she found out is that because she was not on the ground at one of her businesses, right, and most of the areas were flooded, she couldn't get to that particular business, and so she didn't make any money from that business. So she had to realize, um, just through the process of experience, that she had to make sure that her business was weatherproof. So one of the things she talks about is, is your income weatherproof? Do you have um, streams of income outside of the, the physical, you know, going to a shop or going to, you know, a business um, that's brick and mortar? Do you have streams of income outside of that so that if anything happens, you can make it, you can make money outside of that stream, okay? And so what she began to talk about is having online markets that, you know, she believes, and I do believe this as well, that everyone who's in business, you need to have at least one online business of some sort where you're not um, fully dependent on the brick and mortar. Because again, if something catastrophic happens, like what happened in Houston, if it happens in your region, then you have to be thinking ahead, how am I going to keep business going? How am I going to keep my business open? And, um, you know, so she began to talk about the streams of business that she has that's online, um, where she can continue to sell products and it's not dependent on somebody going to the physical building to buy product. All right. So let's take a look here at our book, Tools of Titans, and I'll show you the cover for those of you who like to screenshot. Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss also has a podcast of the same name where he interviews uh, people from all different kinds of walks in, of life. And Tools of Titans is the tactics, routines, and habits of billionaires, icons, and world-class performers. So he's pretty much giving you with this book, he's giving you a peek into some of the top world leaders in their field in different areas and kind of showing you um, what are some tools that they use to be successful in their business life, in their personal life, in their health, all right? So today we are looking at Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly is the senior maverick at Wired Magazine, which he co-founded in 1993. He also co-founded the All Species Foundation, a nonprofit aimed at cataloging and identifying every living species on Earth. Now that is a project. In his spare time, he writes best-selling books, co-founded the Rosetta Project, which is building an archive of all documented human languages, and serves on the board of the Long Now Foundation. As part of the last, he's investigating how to revive and restore endangered or extinct species, including the woolly mammoth. He might be the real world most interesting man in the world. So behind the scenes, he says, <clears throat> sit, sit, walk, walk, and don't wobble. One of, one of his mantras is to sit and sit, walk and walk, and don't wobble. It's the idea that when I'm with a person, it's my total priority. Anything else is multitasking. No, 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 no. To the people, the people to people, person to person, relationships trump anything else. I've given my dedication to this. If I go to a play or a movie, I am at the movie and I am not anywhere else. It's 100%. I am going to listen. 
If I go to a conference, I am going to go to the conference. <clears throat> this is very similar to Derek Seaver's rule of don't be a donkey. <laughs> In a world of distraction, single tasking is a superpower. And so my husband, sometimes he laughs at me because um, I tend to not look at any social media until about an hour before this broadcast. Why? Because I know me. <laughs> and if, it's, if I start looking at social media before a particular time in the morning, I know that I'm either going to get caught up scrolling through something, reading articles, responding to people who ask me questions. And so obviously he's on late, so we're going to help him out. <laughs> So scrolling through stuff, again, asking, uh, answering questions, answering things in my inbox. So I tend to not look at social media before 10 o'clock. That's kind of my rule. Um, if, I am, if I am in a um, place of prayer, okay, I want to give myself fully to that prayer unless I am looking for um, things to pray about, then I might get online and then I'll look over certain articles and things and pray specifically into those or people will inbox me prayer requests. And so I might have my social media open for that. But if I'm in prayer, I really want to be in prayer, hearing what God is telling me for my day. Okay. And also for my world that I'm supposed to be, um, engaging in and caring for. All right. A lot of what happens in our immediate environment is, has, I believe, a lot to do with how aware we are of our immediate environment and how much time we're attending, especially if you're a believer, how much time you're attending to praying over your environment. All right. I pray over my neighborhood. I pray over my neighbors. I pray for the children that I see in my neighborhood. I pray for the schools in my local neighborhood. I pray for the police officers in my local neighborhood. I pray for all of the the air, the waterways and the travelways and the highways in my neighborhood. I pray for the public spaces that people are going into in my neighborhood. Why? Because we are living in a day where anything can happen at any place and at any time. And so I'm always asking God to cover my environment, to cover the people that live in my environment, to cover the people that I'm interacting with in my environment. All right. And so, you know, that's one thing that you can do that can really, as he said, that's a single tasking thing. Okay. <laughs> That's a single tasking thing. Then he says here, <laughs> thank you. I, I think I'll, I'll take that as a sideways compliment. <laughs> but uh, if you want to know how smart I am, you can always look me up online, okay? All right. So Kevin Kelly says here, he's talking about the death countdown clock. He says, I, have, I actually have a countdown clock that Matt Groening at Futurama was inspired by, and they did a little episode of Futurama about it. I took the actuarial tables for the estimated age of my death for someone born when I was born, and I worked backward, all right? He says, I worked back to the number of days. <laughs> I have that showing on my computer. How many days? I tell you, nothing concentrates your time like knowing how many days you might have left. Now, of course, I'm likely to live longer than that. I'm in good health, etc. But nonetheless, I have 6,000 something days. It's not very many days to do all the things I want to do. <laughs> I learned something from my friend Stuart Brand, founder of Whole Earth Catalog and president of Long Now Foundation who organized his remaining days around five-year increments. He says any great idea that's significant, that's worth doing, for him will last about five years. From the time he thinks of it to the time he stops thinking about it. And if you think of it in terms of five-year projects, you can count those off on a couple hands, even if you're young. All right, so 
He's talking about how he organizes his time, how he organizes his life. And then Tim asks him the question, what is one manual project that every human being should experience? He says, you need to build your own house or your own shelter. It's not that hard to do. Believe me, I built my own house. Now, I know Robert Charles is probably going to love that suggestion. <laughs> but um, I would say if you want to scale that down, you can go work with someone like Habitat for Humanity, right? If you want to go learn how to build your own house, I think that's a great organization um, to get involved in to actually increase your skills along that area, all right? Another example that he gives is right to get ideas not to express them and i am a huge proponent of this um i believe in keeping a pad and paper everywhere you are and everywhere you go keep a pad and uh, a notepad and a pen in your car all right if you if your uh your glove compartment box is not too junky put it in there um, keep it, keep it somewhere in your bedroom, right? Keep it somewhere. Maybe you have a guest bedroom, keep it in there. If you're a person like me who wakes up in the middle of the night and has to write down dreams or write down ideas or write down quotations or write down things that just come to your mind and you don't want to disturb your significant other, <laughs> Keep your notepad and your pen in another place where you can just get up, write it down, and then get back to sleep. But I always encourage people um, to have something on hand. If you are ladies and you carry your little purse or your or your little clutch, get you a sticky ta a sticky pad and a pen. Have something with you so that you can write your ideas down. He says, "What I discovered." which is what many writers discover, is that I write in order to think. I'd say, I think I have an idea, but when I begin to write it, I realize I don't really have a full-blown idea. I don't actually know what I think until I try and write it. That was my revelation. For other writers, such as myself, um, some writers tend to see in movie form. So even with my books, when people read them, they feel like they're watching a movie, because that is actually how I write. I actually see a whole film playing out in my mind, and then I began to write based on what I see in the imagery playing out in my mind. So there's different um, kinds of writing. There's different kinds of, of streams of thought on writing, but this is good where he says, write to get ideas, not just to express them. All right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Then... Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rock, for the plug. Then he says, how do you figure out what ideas you want versus what ideas you don't? And this is actually pretty powerful. He says, the ideas you can't give away or kill. I became a proponent of trying to give things away first. And I often do this online, um, but people don't get it. So I have to like go back and say, uh, you might want to jot that down because I just, I gave, I just threw it at you. I gave you a freebie, freebie. Okay. So I like to give out freebies. Um, he says, I became a proponent of trying to give things away first. Tell everybody what you're doing, or you try to give these ideas away and people are happy because they love great ideas. I'll give it to them. And I might say, Hey, it's a great idea. You should do it. I try to give away everything first, and then I try to kill everything else. It's the ideas that keep coming back to me that I can't kill and I can't give away that makes me think, hmm, maybe that's the idea that I'm supposed to do. I'll give you an example. My music, okay? I've given away some music. But the songs that I actually recorded are, are music and are songs that I have sang over the course of about 20 years. And so there are songs that did not go away, <laughs> that stayed within me, and that I could sing at any particular given time. The majority of the songs on my CD 
were are a combination of songs that I have written over a period of 20 years. And so they weren't songs that I was going to give away because those were the songs that represent kind of the, the essence or the core of my spiritual walk with God. Are there other songs that I write or are there other catchphrases that I write and that I give to people? Yes. But as he said, try to give ideas away and then kill the ones that need to be killed. And whatever's left is usually <laughs> awesome. And whatever's left is usually what you're supposed to be working on. All right. And thank you for the music plug there. Appreciate it. All right. So the last thing that he says here is the life skill that you need to learn. The life skill that you need to learn. He says one of the many life skills that you want to learn at a fairly young age is the skill of being an ultra thrifty, minimal kind of person that gives you the ability to operate in survival mode and also be content. It gives you the confidence to take a risk because you say, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is that you might wind up with a backpack and a sleeping bag and eating some oatmeal. Thank you, Kingdom 66. And so what is he talking about? He's talking about early in your life, and I have found this to be true, um, but the way that I found it out uh, was a force. It was forced. And that is learning how to be a minimal person, a minimalistic person, meaning that if you need to drop stuff, you can drop it and not really think about it, okay? That you can live a life on very, very, very little if you have to. There are some, there are some people that literally will lose their minds if you took their stuff from them, literally, because they're so attached to it, okay? Um, I remember being in middle school, and I remember us, my family, becoming homeless, and all we had was one garbage bag full of our clothing for, for me, my sister, and my mother. One garbage bag. That was it. All of our belongings was in one garbage bag. Not to say we didn't have other belongings, but that was all that we could take with us. And we lived um, for four months. We lived from one house to the other house to the other house until I think the last two months that we were homeless together, we wound up staying in one place. And one of the things I learned from that, um, the person that we were staying with, they only... My mom was giving them monies in exchange for staying there until she could get on her feet. And, you know, she, in order for us to stay there, she gave them the money and they said, well, we will feed you. We will feed you all, we'll, you know, we'll feed you and we'll give you a place to stay. Your kids can, you know, either catch the bus stop right outside of, of where we live or if they accidentally miss the bus, they're going to have to walk to school. And so some days we did walk miles to school. And so in that process, when they said they were going to feed us, they didn't tell us that the only thing they were going to feed us was a glass of water, lima beans, and white rice. That was it. Mm -hmm. So two months of a glass of water, white rice, and lima beans. That was it. That was our food. And we got one meal a day. So I've learned, <laughs> okay, as he said, a worst case scenario. I've learned to live in a worst case scenario. I didn't want to learn, but I did. All right. And so I've learned to be content with whatever I have in my life because I've been in places where I've had the bare necessities and I survived it, right? But there are other people who, because they've never had to live without anything, right? They've never had to live without a place to stay. They've never had to live, with, live without what we call the creature comforts. They've never had to live without heat. 
They've never had to live without hot water. Um, and so I look at the people who are in these disaster areas. I look at um, my hometown, South Florida. South Florida has been through worse than, than Irma. Irma was bad, but Andrew was worse, okay? And so because the people of South Florida have already been through that, some of them have, de have developed a resiliency that you're not going to see in other places that have never experienced that kind of devastation. All right. So this is a very powerful lesson that people actually need to get. And in some cases, they might actually need to practice it. You know, so when people say I'm going on a consecration or they say I'm going on a fast, I would ask, I would challenge you to include sometimes in your consecration, minimizing a whole lot of things in your life, not just your food intake, but also these other parts of your life. Begin to minimize those things and ask yourself, you know, can I live without those things? Or am I going to be freaking out because I can't get on my phone every day or I can't get on my phone every five minutes? I have, I have friends right now um, that their only means of contact is through Facebook. They, their phone lines are not working, so they can't call people like they normally would. All right. And they're freaking out because they're not used to that. Some people, they're addicted to their cable. All right. And they're freaking out because they feel like the world is passing them by. And my thing is, maybe this is a time that you can evaluate how much time you're actually giving to television, to media in general. Right. And so, again, you can be forced into these realizations, right? You can be forced into these realizations or, right? You can make the choice for yourself. You can make the choice for yourself. You can do your own sort of dry run of limiting things in your life and really assessing, am I addicted to this thing? Am I addicted to it? You all know my story. When I took a break from social media, all right? <laughs> when I took a break from social media, that was when I really started to listen to my body better. I was already listening to my body, but in that particular window where God said, get off social media, that was the window that I got things done with my health that I needed to get done. Now, what if I had not listened? What if I just said, oh, everything's okay. I'm just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. And unfortunately, especially leaders, we tend to keep going and going and going and going and going. And then we shut down. Our entire body shuts down. And then we're forced into a greater length or greater or prolonged time of recovery when had we heard God tell us to go into that consecration or to pay attention to our body in certain areas and we actually did it, then we would have spent less time in the recovery zone. But so many times we think we're Superman and Superwoman. I know we do because I see it. And we're going, and we're going, and we're going, and we're going. And the people around us, some of them will tell us, you know, you need to slow down, you need to rest, you know, you need to give your mind some time to just process. You need to go on vacation. You need to put your social media down for at least three days. Just turn it all off. Um, and if you cannot turn it off, all right? Take the app and remove the app entirely from your phone so that you're not tempted to go and push that little button. All right? So for some of us, we literally have to remove the apps from our phone <laughs> to stop looking at them for whatever period of time that God is asking us to do it. All right? So we're moving on. Let's see. All right, good. So, 
we're in a section that we're, we're getting ready to go into, and this section has to do with the brain, all right? And we're looking at the book here, You, the Owner's Manual, The Brain. And this first section here is personality-related disorders. Personality-related disorders. A lot of what we see in human beings can sometimes be related to a personality disorder. All right. He says here, one look at Joan Rivers and Eminem gives us a pretty good clue into the beauty of human personalities. We are all a little bit weird. And I agree with that. Yes, I am weird. I don't try to be anybody else but my weird self. I love certain things. I like to do certain things. I like to wear certain things. And if that makes me weird, so be it. <laughs> there are all kinds of eccentric personalities in the world. The laid back surfer, surfer the cerebral artist, the nagging mother-in-law, the driven business executive, the self-deprecating comic. And you know what? You are included on this list too, and that's good. The world would be pretty boring if we didn't have diverse personalities. Somebody say, amen. <laughs> While we applaud the weirdness of the world, we have to differentiate between healthy weird and unhealthy weird. When those personality traits start adversely affecting your life in your daily activities and the way you interact with people, that's when you might have a problem. Keeping your house clean is good. Scrubbing your sink so often that your kids have to make a reservation to use the bathroom is not. Being cautious about driving is good. But being so worried about the possibility of having an accident that you never leave the house is not good. That's the line in diagnosing emotional disorders. Is your personality trait simply idiosyncratic and somewhat endearing? Or is it so destructive that it changes the way that you and others live around you? It used to be that people thought you could turn personality traits on and off. That all it took was the will to change. But now we know that brains are like college freshmen. <laughs> Sometimes they're going to do whatever they want to do, no matter what you tell them. Anxiety, for example, which is characterized by a feeling of uneasiness apprehension or tension in response to stressful situations can be mild or intense enough to trigger panic. Brought on by alcohol, caffeine, and certain drugs, as well as things like a heart problem or a lack of vitamins, some anxiety disorders manifest themselves in such conditions as obsessive compulsive disorder, in which tasks like washing your hands become so habitual that you have to do them 40 times a day. Good for containing germs, but bad for time management. The great news is that knowing about these disorders lets you get in control, so such a disorder will be, will be an annoyance that you can manage and not a major life disruption. All right. So, your brain, the Live Longer Action Plan. When you exercise, you can see your gut shrink. When you stop eating fried calamari, you can see your lousy LDL cholesterol levels drop. When you quit smoking, you can finally stop hacking phlegm out of your throat. As you change habits, you easily see changes in your body. But with your brain, it's a lot harder to gauge how well you're doing. It's not like you can walk around the gym, take off your hat, and flex for everyone. But that's no reason to ignore the very organ that gives you the power to do so. Consider this your plan for building a better brain for now and later. So we're going to start this conversation about how do I build a better brain and we're not going to get through it today because there are several action steps. But let's go ahead and jump into it. Action one, keep all lanes open. To avoid the power line accidents, the ones that lead to strokes, 
It is suggested to take two baby aspirin a day if you're over 40 because aspirin has been shown to help keep your arteries from being inflamed and your blood from clotting, as well as helping blood and oxygen flowing to the brain. Aspirin may also help the body build more blood vessels so that if clots do form, there are alternate routes through which blood can flow around the clogged vessel. Recent studies on aspirin show a decrease in strokes and the sustained use of aspirin or and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen also reduces the incidence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, presumably because it keeps the arteries young. But don't take both ibuprofen and aspirin on the same day. In essence, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory occupies the site in the blood vessels and doesn't let aspirin do its work. They cancel out each other's effect on decreasing the aging of your arteries. Taking 162 milligrams of aspirin a day can have the long-term effect of making you 2.3 years younger when you're 55 and as much as 2.9 years younger when you reach 70. Action number two, exercise your brain exercise your brain. It doesn't matter what part of the body we're talking about. Most everything follows the same mantra. Use it or lose it. If you don't work your muscles, they'll turn to mashed potatoes. If you don't exercise your heart, your arteries will become more clogged than Chewbacca's shower drain. And even urologists give men the same advice when it comes to erectile potency. If you want to keep on writing, you better sharpen the pencil. It's no different with your brain. In fact, you should approach exercising your brain with the same regularity as you do any other exercise. Keeping your brain emotionally and mentally active helps prevent memory loss. The first thing you should do is avoid living on autopilot. That is, doing the same routine day after day. If you can find ways to stretch yourself mentally you'll actually avoid brain shrinkage. The classic way to do this is to learn something new. Hence, Daring Dialogues. Whether it's learning how to speak Spanish, play salsa tunes, or rebuild a car engine, the point is for you to use parts of your brain that you don't normally use. Like muscles, your brain grows when it's working outside of its normal routine. So, what are some things that I do to build my brain or to use my brain? I like to play dominoes. Sometimes I play against myself. I like to play uh, word games. I do crossword puzzles. I do trivia. Um, I especially like Bible trivia. Love Bible trivia. Um, so there are things that you can do, right, that can help you to keep building your brain, to keep exercising your brain. There was a game that I used to play online um, to the point where I think I got like one of the highest scores and it was so used to seeing me log in from my computer that it would no longer let me log in from my computer. So I have to figure out how to get back in. Um, but the game was called Bookworm. Um, Bookworm is a highly addictive game, especially if you are a wordsmith and you are a person who has an extensive vocabulary. You can play Bookworm uh, for, for a very long time. But I would play Bookworm for maybe like an hour a day and I would leave leave my uh, screen up so that I could come back to, to play that particular game. All right? But again, the goal is to do something that forces your brain to exercise and to think. All right? Reading is a good way to exercise your brain. Reading out loud is a good way to exercise your brain. Another way to build your brain is by, as researchers call it, testing at your threshold. One large-scale project measured to see whether testing at your threshold was able to reverse and cause new growth of neurons. In the project, computers were, pro computers were programmed so that an individual computer essentially understood a subject's ability in math. And then that computer programmed a test for its co corresponding subject that stayed in line with the person's ability. Once the computer pushed the limit of each person's ability, testing them at their threshold, the researchers were able to see growth of neurons and dendrites.
But the best part is that the people didn't need to get the answers right in order to reap the benefits. Simply testing themselves just slightly beyond their capability, 80% correct and 20% wrong answers was enough to cause regrowth in their brains. So for you, let's say you can always do Wednesday's crossword puzzle, but you barely get halfway through Sundays. So while the best thing for your ego may be to continue to do crossword puzzles on Wednesdays, the best thing for your brain would be to continue to, to take a whack at Sundays as long as it's not too frustrating. An additional element, of course, is education. The more you know, the more you stretch your brain's capacity for learning. A study of nuns in a monastery is a great example. The researchers analyzed the sentence structure of essays the nuns wrote before entering the convent, then looked at their cognitive functions some 65 years later. Those who used the most complex sentence structure when they entered had the highest cognitive function as they got older. Bottom line, everybody has such diverse interests that you're the only one who can choose activities that will stretch your mind beyond its normal capabilities. You have to choose something you like. It should feel like recess, not study hall. But we can also offer some other suggestions for ways to improve your brain function in everyday life. At work, many people follow the same routine every day. Get coffee, sit down, check eBay or Amazon, get more coffee, return emails, take a bathroom break, do paperwork, call a client, grab lunch, get yelled at by your boss, and so on. I want to say that is not my testimony. Hallelujah. <laughs> of course, only your boss can tell you how to do your job, but we'd like to suggest that you switch up the order every once in a while. Following the same routine every day will not stimulate your hippocampus, the part of your brain most responsible for your memory. To keep your mind active, simply try to vary your routine at work or at home. Start with calls to your clients, write your report first instead of last. Whatever your normal routine is, change the order. All right? So here's one of our favorite ways to stretch your mind. Vacations. Sure. Vacations are great for both your stress levels and for your personal life, but they can also help improve your cognitive skills. And this is the last piece we're going to share before we close out today. How? Maps. When you're driving, walking, or studying the subway system of a new city, you're using many different parts of your brain at once. You're using visual spatial skills to read a map, and then you need to translate it into verbal code to whoever's driving. When you're driving, you need to make quick decisions about where to go, which involves processing information quickly. Hello to everyone who is viewing. And then you store things in your long-term memory to remember where you just visited. Get lost? Even better. Figuring out how to get back is actually contributing to your brain building process. Of course, that kind of all brain training can serve different purposes. For the vacationer, taking a wrong turn may lead you to a quaint antique shop you never have known about. But for a soldier in war, taking a wrong turn can have serious consequences. So I see holla is the word for the day on Twitter and uh, Periscope. <laughs> really, everything just points to the same main advice. Keep learning. It even helps if it's in a formal system. People with higher levels of education and those who continue to be involved in activities that stimulate the mind undergo less mental aging. A college graduate who also continues to learn in formal education settings is 2.5 years younger than a high school dropout. But informal activity helps too. Keeping your mind active keeps arterial aging, immune aging, and even accidents in check. It has a real age benefit of making you one Point three years younger. At the end of the chapter, we'll find ways to text and tax your brain. When we come back next Friday, we're going to look at brain food, actual food that you can eat that helps you to look younger, feel younger, and actually is food that helps your brain operate better. All right. So this has been 
another episode of Daring Dialogues. I hope that you have learned something today that was helpful. And I hope if you're about to get into a routine for the day, I hope that you change something that you're doing, switch it around, and get your brain up and moving in a different direction. All right? So if there are no questions for today, we are done. If you do have any questions, um, please feel free to email me at, and I'll write it up here again, serious inquiries and questions only. All right? Read Shante at gmail.com. So if you have a question, you have a query, you have um, questions about any products or services that I offer, um, you can email me at reachshante at gmail.com. If you like to contribute to Daring Dialogues and what we do here, um, the giving link is in my bio as well as my email address. All right. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I hope that you have a great and wonderful weekend. I will be back tonight at 6 p.m. to finish up my discussion and teaching on prayer. We're going to talk about some practical things that have to do with prayer. And hopefully I will be able to um, have my camera set up so that I can kind of show you visually some things that you can do. Especially for those of you who... Um, again, want to get out of a particular mode and want to do something different with your prayer life and your prayer walk. I'm actually going to be doing some uh, examples, okay? So if you want to participate in that, you can meet me back on Periscope at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or you can find my Facebook group, Cross Training, parentheses, New Believers, and we're also on Facebook. We'll be doing a Facebook Live there. All right. Thank you for your time and attention. Take care and be blessed.